Right, so we've been doing some classes talking about the return of Christ, and we've been looking at the parables in Matthew chapters 24 and 25 to help us get a picture of what that would be like. And last week, we had kind of an abbreviated Sunday school class, and we were looking at the, uh, the parable of the talents. And we kind of went through that quickly, so I did want to take at least a few minutes to to see, um, and so if you want to turn, we're in Matthew chapter 25. Um, so we went through that one kind of quickly. We had some uh, really good thoughts last week, and uh, we had some guests with us that uh, provided some good thoughts as well. And um, so let me get to the right passage here. All right, so. Um, we can go ahead. Let's just go ahead and read those again and see if we just to, to kind of wrap that up. So Matthew chapter twenty-five. Can we read verses fourteen to thirty? Um, and we can either, if you feel ambitious and you want to read the whole thing, Brian. Otherwise, we can just do two pieces. Yeah, that's fine. Two. We'll do two pieces and just work our way around on that. All right, Matthew chapter twenty-five, beginning at verse fourteen. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To the one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained another two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two, talent, two other talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then the man who had received the one talent came. Master, he said, I know that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid, and I went out and hid your talent in the ground. See here, give what belongs to you. But his master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I was, that I reap where I have not sown and gathered where I have scattered no seed. And you ought to have entrusted my money with the bankers and at my coming, I should have received that what was my own with interest. Therefore, take away the talent from him and give it to him to the one who has 10 talents. But to everyone who has, more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. Throw out the worthless slave into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. All right, thank you. So you know, we talked about this last week and a couple points that we brought up, you know, and uh, talked about giving these talents. So a talent was a form of, currency, and um, based, again, just on a commentary I read, it said it was equivalent to 6,000 denarii. A denarius was the daily wage of soldiers and day labor. So according to what I read, that this is a, a talent was a lot. This is a big, big uh, amount they're being entrusted with. Um, but this is something that they're being given that is their master's property. So um, it, we, you know, you try to think about the application here. This is, you know, kind of seeing what we have in life is a gift from God. Um, just making sure we start off with that attitude um, with this parable is this what we have is from God, whether it's our, our life, whether it's 
freedoms we have, our health, our strength, anything that we, we have is something that we have as a gift. And so there's an expectation that that gift we have, uh, we make wise use of it. And we have the faithful servants, we have the bad servants. So the faithful servants go out and they make more talents than what they're given. And we had some discussion last week what it means to get uh, more talents. And they're you know, kind of different perspectives. Um, you know, some people, you know, look kind of from perspective of personal growth, we'll look at those passages and some look at perspective from, um, you know, sharing the gospel and bringing people the truth and we'll look at those passages. Uh, but just the idea, <laughs> excuse me, of being fruitful and growing. So um, there was a good passage that, and I think Jason, you quoted this, but I'd like to start by looking at that. I think it's a really good place. It's in Second Peter chapter 1. So we can flip there really fast. Second Peter chapter 1, and it's verses 5 through 11. And this is, again, more kind of on a personal growth level, but um, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 11. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and if you will receive a rich, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you. So you look at those passages, it's this idea about growing and developing as a believer. You start off, um, you know, again, depending on how you look at this, add to your faith, virtue, virtue, and so on. There's this sort of development that's expected of believers. We're supposed to grow, and it says if you have these things, it'll keep you from being, you know, he has a slightly different version. Mine says keep you from being unfruitful, and the end of that in verse 11 is, um, if you uh, do these things, you'll never stumble, and um, for so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord. And that's what we see in this passage. That's the, the outcome of the good. It says, enter into the joy of thy Lord. So this is a, I think it's a good passage about, you know, just the idea of looking at the talents as personal growth, taking the things that God gives us, and then growing and developing Again, by God's grace and blessing as a believer. Um, there's, and then one other passage I'd like to look at as well is 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And this is more from the perspective of, again, I think somebody shared about um, one of the callings is to share the gospel with others. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Um, Maybe um, verses 9 to 17, if we could read that. First Corinthians chapter 3, verses 9 to 17. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's husbandry, God's building, according to the grace of God, which was given to me. As a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another builds upon it but let each man take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. But if anyone builds on the foundation of gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, stubble, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved. Yet, so as though 
so as through fire. Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. Again, this passage, again, talking about um, looking at the day of judgment, more about, you know, how, you know, Paul is talking about himself and Apollos and the work that they were doing, the building, and comparing that to, you know, the day of judgment, whether that work will endure. So both these passages look at kind of those different perspectives, and I, I would say that kind of both of these things are true. It's just about the idea of growing, it's the idea of using what God gives you and, and doing good, and, you know, of course, in contrast um, to the other guy who doesn't get in to the joy of his Lord because he just buried the talents. He didn't do anything with them. And so, you know, again, there's a um, pretty pretty strong takeaway in that one. Uh, Robert? Of the house built on a rock and the house built on sand, and at our gathering it was, it was commented that sometimes we have to dig for that foundation, and the houses look identical until problems arise, and then the storms can blow away the one without the firm foundation. Um, and this, it kind of speaks to that, I think, here in a way that I hadn't really looked at before. Um, so, uh, yeah, Jason. It's a really interesting statement that I'd never known or noticed before, and, and that is, his work will be shown for what it is. Right? So, as we all are, are building, uh, a portion of this house and, and on top of it. Um, if we have shoddy workmanship, it, it will be revealed. It will be shown for what it is. If we, if we, if we don't continue to, to use quality material, for instance, if we don't continue to um, respect the design that was initially put onto the house. You, you see old farmhouses as you're driving down the road and you have the initial farmhouse that was built and, and it looks neat. And then off to the back of it, you see these other structures that are built off of that farmhouse. And oftentimes they look uh, ramshackly compared to the initial structure that was built. And, and that work shows for what it is. The, the care and the quality wasn't placed into those subsequent rooms that were built 50, 100, 200 years later from the initial building that was laid, from the initial foundation that was laid. And that work will be shown for what it is. It won't be lasting. Um, I guess just you know going back to Matthew chapter twenty-five and just kind of looking at that. So we, um, But yeah, so anyway, you got the parable of talents. And so, again, there's just two very drastic outcomes uh, between the, the servants that use and do something with the gifts that they've been giving and this other servant who doesn't. And um, I think one of the things that I've heard a point being made before about this servant um, who doesn't do anything, what was his view of his master? Did he have a good view of his master? When his master comes, he says, why didn't you do anything? What does he say? How, do, how does he feel about his master? <laughs> yeah, he's a very negative perception. And, you know, some people made that comment. Maybe that's, there's something more to that. It's just like, you know, when you have, depending on how your, your relationship is with God and your view is of God, it, it kind of impacts your service. Because this guy looks at his master, you're a bad guy. I was so scared of you. I just wanted to bury it and be safe, you know? Yeah. Is he saying you take what's not yours? When he says you reap what you don't, you gather what you don't reap and things like that. I didn't understand how to interpret that statement. Yeah. It's, it's profit. He makes profit on his endeavors. It's fair. He doesn't steal it. But it says anyways, he gets it to, because someone uh, pays, you know, we know how it works. You buy something low, you sell it high. It's just part of the of life. If you don't do that, um, you're, you're not going to make it. So um, 
he expects to get appropriate remuneration from his activity. I think we have to be careful of what the man's assessment of his master is versus what the actual master's qualities are, right? So uh, oftentimes we can have a perception of somebody that are completely different than the truth. And this man views his master as a hard man, um, harvesting somebody else's fields, taking somebody else's interests. Um, and that's not a correct assessment, but the master is going to judge him, the servant, on his assessment of the master. And so he's going to use his own judgment against the servant who was worthless, who did nothing. And so he says, you knew, did you, that I was this way? Okay, well then I'm gonna take everything from you and give it to somebody else. What he had was given to him by, by that man. What little he had was given to him. It wasn't something he had earned. Yeah, that's a good question, right? Because I've never thought about that either, but it's kind of like he looks at him because really, it, I, I don't know what he's saying, but it's like when you're given something, like when someone gives you something of theirs to invest, it's theirs and they're going to take their interest on it. But it's like he looks at it as you're stealing somebody else's work or something, you know what I mean? It's it's just this whole perception. It's it's Instead of seeing it as you gave me something to work with, it's like, I'm going to work on this, and you're just going to come take anything I make anyway, so I'm just going to bury it. I mean, is that what his attitude is? I don't know. It's like, what's the point? You're just going to, but then at the end, but the other guys, that's not what happens, right? They're rewarded, so it's almost like his whole perception was that. Yeah. I just wanted to add, it kind of sounds like someone who is, has an investment portfolio, and he is given certain people a portion of his investment stocks to deal with. And the, one of the investors basically, instead of choosing to do anything with it, uh, wastes it and just lets it lie down in the ground and does nothing with it. And therefore, it kind of gives you that idea of if we had someone who was taking care of our stock uh, in portfolio and they did nothing with it, or worse, they even went and took it and did their own thing with it and left us completely high and dry, how would we have responded towards that person who had treated our money that way, much more someone that they gave a significant sum. So he, he was afraid there would be punishment if he failed in his investments. It wasn't that it wasn't worth his time. He just said, well, I've got, he gave me all this money. I know if I lose it, he's gonna be really mean to me. So the safest thing is just to bury it and then I can give him back and he'll be okay because I didn't lose anything. But that wasn't the expectation, it was his job take that risk for his master and, and do it wisely and, and turn a profit. And there are even, like he said, there's even safe investments. You could have given it to the money changers mm -hmm. or whoever and gotten me at least, you know, some bond money back or something, something, do something is the point. Um, and, and doing nothing is not the safe bet is the other point. <clears throat> kind of comes down to mindset too. We can have a mindset of limit, a limiting mindset on what we can, can do in our life. Uh, and it's, it's very self-limiting. But then there is a growth mindset or a mindset of um, there's limitless possibilities, um, even in harsh times. Um, and and I, you, I think you see that contrast here where one servant had a did not have a mindset of of growth uh, was very much limited himself where the other two you know, on their different abilities increased what was uh, was given to them I think you can see a connection between what Jesus said in John 15 when he says ye have not chosen me but i've chosen you and ordained you that you should go out and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain so jesus chose these servants and he expected them to go out and produce fruit and two of them did and one of them did nothing you know and i think that's his point is that he expected them to use the talents or the gifts that he gave and you know peter over in first 
Peter chapter 4, he says, um, but the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober-minded and watch unto prayer, and above all things have fervent love among yourselves, for love shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So God, Jesus, they expect us to use these gifts and to, to do things for one another and take care of one another. And, you know, so two of them were active. The other one did nothing, I think, is kind of the, the problem. There's consistency in Jesus' parables, too, on, on this, because he's got another parable where a man has a servant, and he's out in the field, and he cooks the dinner, and then the assessment of that servant is, he's, he's a wicked servant because he's only done what is asked of him, right? So Jesus says, these are things which are good. Do more. Do better, right? I, I, I want a good return on my investment in you. I want you to be the best that you can be, a hundredfold, you know, tenfold, whatever that is. I, I want you to do more than just ask, but to look for ways to do good. It's an interesting uh, thought on the commentary. The man considers himself one of the Lord's servants within the household but he clearly felt he had been given too little to do anything much with. But actually the talent was worth uh, nearly 20 years wages. He didn't appreciate the greatness of what he had been given. That's a comment, it's a commentary on it, a Bible app. Mm -hmm. So he considered himself a servant, but maybe because the others got more, he felt slighted and was offended and created these excuses. Yeah. And, um, did himself in. Yeah, that's, and there's a good practical takeaway for us, right? You can look and say, okay, somebody else is, you've got these brothers that are like worldwide speakers or whatever, you know, things like that, and who am I? But like the servant, it's like, you know, do whatever, use whatever God gives you. Um, all right, so, go on. He says, uh, for as many, for as we have many members in one body and all members have not the same office. So we being many are one body in Christ and every one members one to another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the pro proportion of faith or ministry, let us wait on our ministering or he that teacheth on teaching or he that exhorteth on exhortation. On he that giveth, let him do it with liberality. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor that which is evil and cling to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love and honor, preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing diligent in prayer, distributing to the necessity of the saints. I mean, it just keeps going on. And we've all got different things. And one's not more important than another, you know. I mean, I, I remember as a young brother, one of the, to me, one of the most important things was I knew every Sunday there was going to be one brother that when I walked into that meeting, that brother was going to stand there and he was going to greet you. And he greeted. And you knew it. Every, every Sunday he was always there. And he always said the same thing. He would always say, he would say, how are you doing? And, and we, you know, you'd say, well, I'm doing great. How are you doing? He says, well, I would say, I would say good. No, he, he, he would say, I, I, um, I would say pretty good, but you might argue about the pretty. <laughs> and, he, and he said that every week. I mean, every week. And one week you'd go there and he's not there. I mean, you, you immediately, you knew he was missing. Where other members, you might figure later, oh, so and so's not here, but that's this brother, he was there every every single every day, I mean or every week. And he, he always greeted you and he said the same thing. And so you were just waiting for it. I mean, you know. And so, I mean, you wouldn't think of that as a great thing, but it's something I really cherished, you know. So we all have different gifts. And so I don't think we should think of one thing more important than the other, which I think is what you were just getting, you know say that is a good passage that i think 
correlates with this one because it's all different items, kind of like what the master hands out. Yeah. I have a note here from Brother Paul Martin. He says, we all have different gifts or talents. Too much is given, much will be required. Let's invest our talents by sharing our precious hope for the kingdom of God. He says, how? By all that we come into this contact this week, see our talents. I think that's along the lines of what I was saying. Yeah, and also, even if we do have all these great talents and gifts, if we don't do it with them, how... If we do it without love, then it's like a sounding gong, something that you can't even appreciate or enjoy. So that's something we need to bear in mind with how we use these talents and how we serve our Lord. I don't know if this has been said already or not, so I'll say it. The one who had one talent, he saw the talent as his, his to keep, his to do what he wanted to. And the others saw it as a talent that was loaned and they were to do something with it. He didn't see it that way. He saw if he did something his master gained from it, his master was taking his talent. So that's the way I see it, it's different. And I think in general, as we're looking at the parable and remembering it's a parable, to those who succeeded, the word or ability of faithfulness is attributed to them. They were faithful. And as a result of their faithfulness, they received a reward. This third person was not faithful. The word was not even associated with him. But yet he received a reward as well. Uh, indignation from his master and being thrown into utter darkness. So I think the parable teaches us to enjoy and happiness, serve our Lord, whatever he requires of us. And yeah, it's all his, but he will make it abundant in our lives if we just give him the chance. Something just came to mind, you know, about this talent. Um, Brother Randy talked about, you know, in our in our faith, there's a mindset that we want to guard the faith and keep it pure to the point where we don't share it, you know, because we don't want to stain it and we don't want to, you know, mess it up. We want to keep it polished. I think that's kind of the same concept of the the um, the man that buried his talent. He didn't want to mess it up. He didn't want to stain it. Um, and so our, our faith is, is something that we should share, and, and God will, will keep it shiny and, and protect it. Something slightly ironic about that all is that when you actually put something that's costly and precious back into the earth, it does become slightly tarnished, and it becomes... Uh, not nearly as pretty as it once was because all the impurities in the earth have now corrupted it. So the same thing that we can think about if we try to hide something or keep something hidden in relation to the truth is we can actually make it corrupt in our own way by either uh, disobeying certain practices or teachings that Christ had already commanded us from the idea of shining one's light to all sorts of different things that uh, we can look at in comparison. I'm late, so maybe you guys already talked about this. Um, whenever I read this parable, I sympathize with this servant because I, I see, whenever I read it, I see him as being afraid that he's going to like lose the money, right? Like he's gonna invest it poorly. And, and perhaps he might be afraid because he, he's still accountable for the amount of money that he was given. And so he might have to come up with that money one way or the other. Um, and I, I don't know how to, like, if, if that was the scenario, if he actually lost money, I don't know what, like, the spiritual, like, correlation is there. Like, what, like, how does that match up with our spiritual lives, if that makes any sense? If we fail, you know, if we do invest, but we fail at our investments, what's, you know, well, I'll stop talking. <laughs> 
What do you want? Oh, we'll just work our way up. All right. Go back this way. One of the things that the master says to the man who did it was, you could have at least done this as a minimum, right? If you weren't willing to take the risk, give it to somebody who is or somebody who will loan it out and get the money back with usury, right? It, I don't, I'm, I'm not giving you this so that you can sit on it. it, it let's say you don't feel confident or you, you don't feel like you are qualified to, to make the investments that would come from this, whether it's in yourself or in preaching or however that talent is viewed, at, at least support then others then who will do that. You might not be willing to do it, but at a minimum, help support others who are willing to make that, that choice to make those investments. So <clears throat> the fundamental dichotomy is between fear-based thinking and faith-based thinking. Fear-based thinking says, hide it so you don't lose it. Faith-based says, go for it because I know that God can make, make things work out okay. And that's, I'm taking a little beyond the parable, the context of the parable, because I want to make the point, because the, the, I, the purpose of the parable is to make the point to us that if you invest the time and energy, God is going to yield results. If you do not, then that is worthy of rejection. And there's another verse that I don't recall the location of that says that the fearful will not inherit the kingdom. It goes through a whole list of people, I, uh, adulterers and idolaters and all this and, and it goes down to fearful so fearful is as bad as everything as anything fear is a sin it's not n labeled in the ten commandments but it will get you killed and a, a practical example um, once I was whitewater rafting in the Gauley River and I fell out of the raft and they told you in the training the brief training before they throw you in the river is, is don't freeze, be an active participant in your own salvation. And so I did freeze, even though I'm very comfortable in the water, the fact that I got launched out of the boat just caught me completely by surprise. And um, the guide in the boat stuck his paddle handle out to me to grab, which oddly enough was cross-shaped. Um, and I just looked at him and I could have reached out and grabbed the paddle and I didn't. I was completely frozen. And because of that inactive inactivity, I spent the next five minutes underwater uh, and under the raft and under multiple rafts and uh, finally got hauled into another raft and passed out. But um, if I had reached out and grabbed the, the handle that was extended to me, I could have shortened that trial a bit. The point is don't freeze, it'll kill you. I feel like there's a really good quote somewhere, and I can't piece it together, but it says something about we all have fear, but courage is acting in spite of that fear, or something like our faith is that. There's a really good one, but I, I don't know if I'd say, I think fear is a natural thing, but it's just do we let that control us? Is, you know, but, yeah, thank you for that. Um, um, I think Jesse had a great point. I think that's probably what Jesus was trying to tell his disciples. Like, if you go out, like, I will be with you. Like, God will be with you to succeed. So don't worry about failing. Um, yeah, that's it. Conversation's going all over the place. But to that point, Jesus sent, out, sent them out with nothing. He said, don't take anything. And to that degree, he was going to teach them to trust him by not taking money belt or, or anything, shoes. Well, well thank you, everyone. Really good comments uh, this week. You know, I, I kind of thought we'd be, you know, let's wrap up a few points and then move on to the other. <laughs> but we obviously had a lot more to talk about. Um, so that's good. Um, and, you know, I, as I kind of look through this, it's like this is something that I really want to keep in my prayer life is, you know, what is just reflecting on what are the things that I have, you know, and sometimes it's easy to overlook certain items, you know. Um, I remember there was, um, you know, if you've ever met someone who's come from a country where they have a lot of restrictions on their freedoms and things like that, and, you know, we, we can certainly do a lot more than maybe a brother or sister in, in China or in Saudi Arabia or somewhere like that, and 
just a lot of simple things we don't think about and that really should be a prayer is, you know, what are the, the things that God has given us and how can we um, use those for good in, uh, for his service and the service to others. So uh, thank you, everyone, for the comments this morning. Um, God willing, next week we're um, going to go into the final parable that we're going to look at on this topic on the return of Jesus, and that's uh, the parable of the sheep and the goats. Um, and that's going to start in verse 31, and it's going to go to the end of the chapter. Um, and again, a, another, I guess you'd say, you know, each of these parables, it's like there's, you kind of have this scenario that's set up, and then at the end of the scenario, there's a very drastic reward. You're either um, everlasting life or punishment and fire. And, you know, it's a, it's a very dramatic, but that's how Jesus wants us to, to think about is just, you know, how we use our life today. So it's a some very challenging parables, and uh, I appreciate all the good thoughts that people have shared. I feel like I learn a lot just by you know, coming to class and listening. <laughs> so, so thank you, everyone. Um, but God willing, we'll look at that next week. Thank you.